Gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, third Trust panel series. Um, you may realise that I'm not Lord Wolf, um, who uh, is um, after whom the Institute is named. Um, uh, Harry is presently uh, tied up at the House of Lords um, with the, uh, an interesting debate, shall we say. Um, uh, and the Archbishop has just arrived, so he can give us the latest information and the odds uh, on who's going to win the vote. Uh, but my name is Ed Kessler. Uh, I'm founder director of the Wolf Institute, um, and uh, I'd like to uh, introduce this event by telling you a little bit about the, the Trust Research Project, of which this is a spin off. Uh, about uh, two years ago, we began a research project under the leadership of uh, Dr. Shana Cohen, and some of the researchers are here today uh, Jan Bock and Sami Everett to look at the, what happens in the face of austerity in terms of relations between faith communities. Are the communities competing for a smaller pot of money or are they engaging in more collaboration? And what we've found and in London, and we're now taking it to Paris, Berlin and Rome, is there's greater collaboration on the ground which is retaining reasonably high levels of trust that uh, perhaps we don't necessarily have uh, in, our relig uh, in our national leaders, with the exception, of course, of these three in front of us. Uh, the levels of trust in our uh, judiciary, in the police, uh, in the media, uh, in our religious institutions has declined over the years. But at a local level, it's remarkable how the trust is um, maintaining its standards. And we're very intrigued by that, and that is the research project. The first panel looked at trust in public life. Um, the second uh, looked at trust in business, and now we're looking at trust in religious leadership. What sort of expectations should we have as men of, and women of faith and of no faith should we have in our religious leaders? Uh, the series is being chaired by uh, Wolf Institute uh, Vice Chair of Trustees, Lord Blair, uh, who will introduce our speakers in a moment. Now, the Wolf Institute is dedicated to the study of relations between Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Uh, when it was established back in 1998, I don't think any of us realized how significant understanding this encounter would be. I'm very grateful for uh, supporters of the Institute over many, many years, some of whom are here tonight, who have helped us on our way and helped us educate over 2,000 people during this period of time in whatever profession you may have, not simply ministers of religion, um, but um, lay, um, a whole range of different professionals, including the Foreign Office, um, understanding relations with other faiths is vital in whatever profession and vocation uh, which we have. Um, it's with great pleasure that I'm going to hand over to uh, Ian in, the moment, uh, in a moment, who will introduce um, all three speakers, two of whom I'm pleased to say are patrons of the Wolf Institute, um, and the third, uh, Tim, uh, is a colleague um, and head of the Muslim College where um, Wolf Institute staff contribute towards the teaching. Um, I would finally like to acknowledge the support of the Templeton World Charitable Foundation, um, which is one of the two main funders of this uh, multi-country, multi-year project um, and uh, we're very grateful, uh, Andrew, for your support. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you, Lord Blair, um, who will introduce our speakers, um, and on we go. Thank you very much indeed. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Ed, thank you very much indeed. Um, this has been a very interesting series of conversations that we've had uh, over these last uh, 12 months or so uh, with these three particular areas of civic life, uh, leadership in public life, leadership in business, and now religious leadership. Uh, I think it, is, it would be utterly unfair to the previous speakers to suggest uh, in, in any way that any one of the panels is of particular eminence uh, and interest, but I certainly have to say, I think on this occasion, Wolf has uh, done extraordinarily well to get uh, speakers of such significance as we have uh, tonight. Um, what marks each of uh, the men in front of you is not only their eminence and their intelligence, their courage in saying things that sometimes are surprising, 
but also the journeys which they have taken. Uh, uh, um, Justin Welby, um, from oil executive to archbishop, that is a very interesting path to have taken. Ephraim Mervis from South Africa to, to chief rabbi of Ireland, to chief rabbi via being the first rabbi in the United Kingdom to ask an imam to give a sermon in his synagogue. And Tim Winter, from what he described to me as a, as a Middle English childhood uh, via Cairo and Jeddah to be one of the foremost scholars uh, of Islam in the world. We have found that the themes around trust and lack of it have been interestingly similar. Uh, but I noticed that the panellists have sometimes felt that their sector, as the questions went on, was particularly under scrutiny. And let me say to the three of you, far from it. And I'm going to call into support the quote I used uh, when I opened the first of the series, uh, because it's about parliamentarians, of which I have the privilege to be one. Because leaders not only have to set the strategy, they also occasionally have to be aware of the details, like where the comma is. Do you remember eats, shoots and leaves? Uh, well, on, in April 2014, the Times Diary produced a small note which said that a longboat full of Vikings promoting the new, it was then, the then British Museum exhibition, they produced a longboat and it was seen sailing past the Palace of Westminster yesterday. Famously uncivilised, destructive and rapacious, with an almost insatiable appetite for rough sex and heavy drinking, comma, the parliamentarians nonetheless looked up for a bit to admire the vessel. <laughs> if that can be said about parliamentarians, it just shows what a long way from public trust and esteem we have got. And with that, I'd like to ask Justin Welby to come up and speak. Each of the uh, speakers will be asked to speak for just 10 minutes, and then we'll have a question and answer session. Justin, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. I never tire of being introduced on these occasions. It always tells me what I'd like to be, but have never got anywhere near being. So thank you very much. Um, Christian leadership has had its ideal, and every form of leadership that inspires trust has to start with an ideal, set out in the 13th chapter of St. John's Gospel the washing of the feet, Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. And its practice set out more often than not, typically by what we find at the top of what is called Lollard's Tower at Lambeth Palace. It's where we take people quite regularly. Uh, at the top of Lollard's Tower, it's the one nearest the river. There is a dungeon dating from the 15th century and scratched into one of the walls in Latin, it says, pray for us, poor followers of Wycliffe. That has been the type of Christian leadership that has been too often the rule rather than the ex exception. Trust is established by not only a benevolent ideal, but also by coherent practice. And that's where the church and many religious institutions have not always done well. I will come back to that. In an age of collective mistrust of institutions arising from the hermeneutic of suspicion, what advantage do they want to gain over us, being the question people instinctively ask as soon as an archbishop appears on the telly, or it were still what Pope uh, Francis called to his Synod of Bishops two and a half weeks ago, a hermeneutic of conspiracy, uh, which is probably best summed up by the immortal Kenneth Williams in Carry On Caesar, when he said, inf as he was stabbed, infamy, infamy, they've all got it, infamy. <laughs> Religious leaders can only witness to trustworthiness. 
by the way they act and cannot demand it or expect it as a given. Within the Christian faith, within Anglicanism, we have demanded it as a given, and the habit of doing that breeds yet more distrust. Trustworthy religious leaders foster communities that live by markers and habits of virtue. The parable of the Good Samaritan that Jesus tells when asked, who is my neighbour, is one that points to the kind of person that builds trust. He, uh, Jesus tells this parable to someone who is questioning him with a certain amount of genuine interest, perhaps also a desire to see if he can catch him out, but mainly genuine interest. And Jesus replies by telling the story of someone who acts beyond the barriers, who overturns the markers and limits of virtue and puts in new ones that are expansive and reach even to the enemy. And that's perhaps why, as Ed just said, wherever he's gone, uh, Ed just said that local rather than national religious leadership is much more easily established. Having been a parish priest, everyone in the parish knows when the parish is doing something well. Everyone also knows when you've made a mess up of something and they don't half tell you. But the reality is when you've done something good, when you've set up a youth club that's made a difference to, to young people running around uh, uh, vandalising things, when you've set up a food bank, when you've, as one of the parishes in my diocese has recently done in Canterbury, set up a community bank, a food bank, debt counselling and help for people to find jobs. The result has been that everyone knows and trusts that church. There is a standard and a habit of virtue. At a national level, it's much harder because all you see is the talking head. Pope Francis, by his transparent goodness and holiness, to a large degree manages to overcome that. Trust in a living God who forgives and offers new beginnings for the broken, offers a foundation and model for developing relationships of trust that can withstand the sinfulness and frailty of human behaviour, is at the heart of what builds trust in religious leadership. Trust in Christian theology is seen most clearly in the Trinity, the idea of the one God in three persons who interrelate with each other in a love that ob obliterates the faintest shadow of doubt in one another. And it is based on unconditional love offered and received. Love is the key to trust in Christian thinking. And one of the hardest things, going off script for a moment, for which I will doubtless get into trouble, but one of the hardest things, I think, in Christian leadership, and I don't know if uh, either of my colleagues would say this in their own field, is how hard it is not to turn against those who attack or slander or even judge one without knowing what they're saying. But the picture we are given by Jesus is of unconditional, unrestrained, unlimited love. And it is that that establishes trust. Theology and ideology are essential to provide a framework within trust, which can, trust can be developed, but they are also the most easily abused. I'm not going to talk about any other examples than within my own faith tradition, but I have in the, in the last three weeks within the Church of England, we have had to announce about two previous bishops who were involved in the sexual abuse of children or vulnerable adults. What could be more abusive of trust? What could be more destructive of trust? And it is the twisting of theology and ideology to give power to someone in a position of authority that lies behind that in many ways. 
Moving on from the fundamental issues of the ideal and the theology to the issue of truth. The experience of reconciliation with religious leadership and religious ideology and theology begins with truth-telling and a willingness both to listen and engage. I've, I'm watching at the moment and working with uh, Anglican leaders in Burundi and South Sudan as they wrestle with catastrophic outcomes of civil war and have been there and been in the middle of that situation, trying to see how we could support them. How do you build trust in religious leadership in a position where nobody trusts anyone they can't see and see that they're not holding a weapon aimed at them? It comes down in both those cases to, again, the unconditionality of the love that they offer all whom they meet and their willingness to put their lives on the line on a regular basis. Self-awareness in religious leaders through prayerful reflection and accountability by demanding spiritual directors, by going on retreat from the pressing and the immediate to reflect on the timeless and the eternal, enables us to come back to the points in which we betray our own ideal, in which we begin to build Lollard's Tower rather than to wash feet. Transparency about mistakes of the past and a willingness to acknowledge collective responsibility. Bishop Martin in Chichester did not abuse the survivor to whom he apologised most profoundly, genuinely and with tears last week. But he acknowledges that collective responsibility and the survivor said through their lawyer that it was one of the most healing moments of the agony they've gone through over the years. And then lastly, religious leadership must have an appropriate anthropology, an appropriate understanding of, whom, of who the human being is. The fallenness and sinfulness of all human beings is not just an excuse for lowering our expectations to easily realisable levels. That would be a wrong thing to do. But enables a common sense that failures will happen, but there is always forgiveness and a new beginning. And that offering of forgiveness, not to oneself but to others, that setting aside of failure where people have let me down, is what builds up trust. It is not asking for blind allegiance, but it is also not being distrustful ourselves. It is investing in others, even when they fail or mess up. Christian leadership is visionary but believes that the means are as significant as the ends. The journey is essential to the destination. The Sermon on the Mount defines the values of the kingdom of God that subvert common preconceptions of the world we inhabit. If God is king and history is moving inex inexorably towards a moment of judgment and recreation and renewal of the world, then we are freed as leaders to invest in the future by living with integrity and transparency today, regardless of the results we see. For me, that always takes me back to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who never saw the outcome. He missed by barely a month the outcome of everything he saw, sought, and yet his effect was undiminished. Building trust involves taking others through the process of our strategic and tactical thought including changes in direction and emphasis, but in a way that enables them to become part of it, to criticise, to argue, to differ, which there is no absolutism, but a final stripping of our outer clothing, taking a towel and washing feet. Thank you. Justin, thank you very much indeed. Ephraim, can I invite you, if you would, to follow on? My lords, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I feel very privileged to <coughs> sit on such a distinguished panel, and I would like to thank the Wolf Institute for inviting me to do so and to have an opportunity to share some brief thoughts with you. And I would also like to congratulate 
Dr. Ed Kessler, and to everyone associated with the Wolf Institute for the truly outstanding initiatives they undertake in order to champion interfaith dialogue, understanding, and reconciliation. The question that's being posed to us this evening is a serious and important one. Very sad that we are called upon to comment on it, but exceptionally important. And I would like to draw on six biblical texts in order to share with you a Jewish perspective. The first is Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. Ve'asuli mikdash v'shachanti betocham. Make for me a sanctuary, says God, so that I shall dwell in them. If you were to ask me, what were the two most significant building projects in the entire Bible? My answer would be the Tower of Babel, as is described in the book of Genesis, and the building of the sanctuary in Exodus, followed on by the temple in the book of Kings. And when you come to think of it, these two were direct opposites. With regard to the Tower of Babel, the Midrash tells us that while engaged in the project, if a brick would fall to the ground and would smash into pieces, the builders would cease their activity and they would come down to the ground, sit around that brick and mourn its loss. If, however, one of the buildings fell down to his death from the scaffolding, they wouldn't bat an eyelid. They would continue with their project. In the Mishkan, the sanctuary, God says, Make for me a sanctuary so that I shall dwell in them. Not so that I shall dwell in it, but in them. The purpose of the ultimate house of God is not just so that God should dwell in it, but far more importantly, so that the Spirit of God would enter into those who come inside it. And when they would emerge from it, they would carry the Almighty with them in their hearts and in their minds. So we therefore find that the Tower of Babel existed for the sake of the building, the institution, the organization. And if part of that institution broke or fell into pieces, that's what they mourned the loss of. But the people whom it was there for, that didn't matter to them at all. The organization came before the people within it. But God tells us otherwise. In our sanctuary, the people are the most important part of it. The sanctuary is defined as being there for the sake of the people. And I believe that this is so relevant to us. Because within all of our faith groups, often we are challenged by a scenario in which we need to choose a priority. What's more important? The welfare and well-being of an individual who might have been abused, who might have a complaint, or the reputation of our organization, which might suffer as a result of us acting in a genuine and sincere way. We, need, we shouldn't take the Babel approach, rather it should be the sanctuary approach. The people whom we are here to serve, they must always take precedence, their welfare and their well-being, over the reputation of the organizations that we serve. My second text is Isaiah chapter 26, verse 4. Trust in the Lord for all time, for the Lord God is the rock of all ages. When God addresses us about the subject of trust with regard to our relationship with him, the simile that is given is a rock. A rock weathers all storms. The rock is not prone, prone to be influenced by egos and politics. The rock always stays the same. And so too, if we want to benefit from the trust of others, as spiritual leaders, we need to be like rocks. Not to allow politics and egos to get in the way of us standing up for all that which is true and genuine with full sincerity. In my experience, I have found that even those who would disagree with one, hopefully, will respect one for one's sincerity. And as a result, they will place their trust in the genuine character that one has as a spiritual leader. The third text, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 4. 
ונמצא חן ושכל טוב בעיני אלוקים ואדם. Let us find grace and favor in the eyes of God and of man. When it comes to finding grace and favor, popularity, God must come before mankind. We should always strive to do that which is right in the eyes of the Almighty. And interestingly enough, at the end of the book of Esther, five accolades in the concluding verse are given to Mordechai, the Jew who is instrumental in saving his people, and one of them is Veratsui Lerov Echav. He was popular amongst the majority of his brethren. You might have thought that after saving our people, he would enjoy universal popularity. But actually, that's the ultimate compliment to a true religious leader. Most people thought he was great. Rabbi Yisrael Salanta, one of our most foremost rabbis of the 19th century, said, if as a rabbi everybody loves me, it means I'm not a rabbi. And if everybody dislikes me, it means I'm not a human being. So uh, the mark of true leadership is courage. Being a person true to one's convictions. Doing that which is right. Even though sometimes it might make one unpopular. Because ultimately we're here to do that which is right in the eyes of God. My fourth text are two entire chapters of the Bible. Exodus chapters 38 and 39, a balance sheet. Moses was called upon to build the sanctuary. We're given all the details of the implements, of the furnishings, of all the people who were to assist him, of the donations given by the nation. And Moses, with full transparency, runs through the entire list of everything he was given and how he used it. So much space in the Bible, which usually is so restrictive in its nature with the words that it uses in order to show that a true and great leader is one who is transparent in everything that he does. And it was in that context that in temple times, the high priest had no pockets in any of his garments. There were altogether eight garments that the high priest wore on various occasions. Never any pockets. Nothing should be hidden from people. We need to be open what you see is what you get with regard to our spiritual leadership. My next text is an entire book of the Bible, the book of Leviticus, because therein we are called through our sacrificial right to come close to the Almighty, and a key component of that is the sin offering. The religious leader must have the courage, where appropriate, to acknowledge wrongdoing. His guilt. And he's called upon, sometimes on his own personal behalf and sometimes on behalf of the nation, in a collective manner, to ask God for forgiveness. And we're taken in the book of Leviticus through the duties of the high priest and the entire nation on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, encouraging us to consider all our wrongdoings of the past. And the Jewish concept of atonement is a very important and relevant one. Maimonides tells us that there are three parts to true atonement. The first is charata, regret. The second is kabbalah, resolutions for the future. And the third is ma'aser, actually changing the situation for the better. And all three are important. First of all, charata, regret. The Archbishop of Canterbury made reference to an act of regret which touch people's hearts. It's very important that when we apologize for our wrongdoings, for things which either we have committed or others have committed under our watch, that it shouldn't seem to be a policy that we're adopting with regard to our apology. It needs to be genuinely sincere. And if it's not genuinely sincere, that's a sign that we shouldn't be spiritual leaders in the first place. Because if we aren't sincerely sorry for such awful wrongdoings which might have taken place on our watch, then who are we to set an example for others? There must be genuine regret. Secondly, a resolution. We, in the light of what has happened in the past, undertake to do certain things in the future. And thirdly, to deliver to actually change the situation for the better. And the ultimate test of atonement is point number three, 
when you actually do deliver to guarantee that the wrongs of the past will never again happen in the future. And my sixth and final text comes from the biblical account of creation in Genesis chapter 1. There is a fascinating Midrash teaching of our rabbis. On the sixth day when man is created, having previously said on each day, and the Lord saw that it was good, this time it is tov ma'od, very good. And the Midrash takes the word ma'od, which means very, and it tells us, don't read ma'od, read mavet. Don't read, read, read very, read death. Ma'od and mavet, very and death sound a bit similar. There's a very powerful message here. There is no English word called veriness, but that's what ma'od means. Veriness equals death. Because when one reaches a situation of extremism, it is dangerous for our society and it can lead to murder. And so on the very first day of the creation of mankind, God warns us against a radical approach to life. And then we find in the very next chapter an example of how veriness led to death. Within the very first family on earth, everything about Cain was his veriness. He was very passionate. He was very jealous. He was very religious. He was very angry. And that led him to kill his brother Abel. So I can only speak for my faith and the context within which we operate. And I know that this notion is shared by many other great world faiths. And that is that a true religious path of life is one of moderation and not of extremism. That is not true religion. And so today we find that, alas, there have been examples of child sexual abuse and financial impropriety and of extremism and of many other examples of what we can all describe as being an abuse of trust. The way forward is for us as faith leaders, first of all, to be rocks of trust like God. Secondly, where appropriate, to apologize and to apologize correctly. Thirdly, we need to act always with transparency. And finally, we need to let the members of our faiths know we're here for you because your welfare and your well-being is the very essence of our faith. Thank you very much. Yeah, from that, was, uh, that was simply magnificent. Thank you very much. And I'm particularly grateful for this uh, sort of unwanted experience of sharing a panel with uh, two such distinguished uh, spiritual leaders of my country. I cannot compete with their uh, eminence uh, knowledge uh, because uh, I have no community, I have no congregation, I am a member of the Muslim community but have no generally recognised uh, leadership role within it. So uh, in any case I'm grateful to the organisers for giving me this opportunity and the benefit of the doubt. I think it might help if, since my community is relatively recent here and perhaps poorly understood, if I begin with a few general descriptive remarks as to how religious leadership and authority actually work in the Muslim community and the Muslim world. That might seem something of a fool's errand. After all, the Muslim world is a quarter of the global population and a very turbulent Jim, and in many ways... I ask you to speak up a bit? Yes. I think people are having a bit of a trouble at the back. This. Somewhat turbulent, rapidly changing uh, quarter of the world's population and the British Muslim community represents much of that turbulence, uncertainty, uh, lack of trust in traditional institutions and uh, individuals uh, in a kind of microcosm. There are a few generalizations that can be offered. We are perhaps 3.5% of the national population, but we are told that we might rise to 18% by the year 2040. Uh, that imposes upon us enormous responsibilities in terms of creating a coherent, theologically authentic 
but also socially and politically relevant uh, leadership, a ch set of challenges which I think we have only just begun to theorize. But this community uh, does generate leaders, although the uh, public conversation in this country is generally not clear about who speaks for Britain's Muslim communities. The community itself does recognize leaders. Uh, these are the muftis, these are the heads of the various seminaries. These are people who usually, not through appointment from above, but simply by being trusted by base communities have achieved positions of very considerable eminence and influence in a community that continues to set very considerable store by the message that emanates from the pulpit. We have perhaps between 30 and 35 seminaries in this country producing about 800 Muslim faith leaders uh, every year. Massive overproduction, I suspect, but uh, the number of the seminaries continues to increase. On top of that, we have Muslims who are training across the Islamic world so that there are 400 British Muslims now enrolled at al Azhar University in Cairo. There are a number in Morocco, an increasing number in Turkey, and so on. Perhaps uh, three, 4,000 British Muslims are learning to be faith leaders uh, outside the boundaries of this country. And when they return, confronting congregations that are themselves asking very deep questions about belongingness both to their tradition uh, and to uh, the wider society, often unhappy community in a state of considerable flux, uh, what is expected of them? Well, many things are not expected of them, and in this respect I think they can breathe a sigh of relief because they are trusted to maintain the forms the basic patterns of Muslim worship are essentially unchanged for hundreds of years. One is trusted not to interfere with that. If one introduces some new form of worship, one will find that one's congregation diminishes to about zero within the course of a week. One is trusted not to fiddle with time-honoured liturgies. And the same goes for the other basic ritual practice, such, such as the fast of Ramadan, the Hajj pilgrimage, and other basic givens of the faith. But when the imam ascends the pulpit and looks down upon the sea of expectant faces, and sometimes it is a very large sea, there are several mosques that have routine congregations of more than 5,000. Our own congregation for the Eid prayers in Cambridge is about 3,000. These are significant numbers of people. On what basis does one claim the right to speak to so many extraordinarily different people with so many different needs? a microcosm of places that uh, are very different and who perhaps are recent arrivals. I remember myself ascending the pulpit in Cambridge to preach to a congregation uh, just after the Iraq invasion had begun. And this was particularly difficult because although there were many in the congregation who supported the toppling of Saddam Hussein, uh, and those included, for instance, some Kurds, one or two of whom had, were still bearing the marks of torture under Saddam Hussein and could not, as a result, perform the motions of the prayer correctly. But at the same time, there were many people who thought that this would end in disaster and was another example of Anglo-Saxon vainglory and imperialism. How to preach in a way that would retain the trust of both of those points of view was extraordinarily difficult. Well. One clue was given to me by one of my teachers now, now departed, uh, an old Yemeni sheikh in Mecca in the 1980s. I'd been studying for some years and was wondering whether I might actually make myself useful in a mosque community and start to preach. And I wanted to know, is there some requirement for being authorized? How do I know that God actually wants me on the pulpit? On what basis can I set myself up as a leader uh, implicitly authorized to lead the prayers and the thoughts and even the moral life of so many needy human beings. I memorized enough texts to be able to do it. That doesn't in fact take very long. So how can I know? Well, the teacher told me something that startled me, which is that when you look out over a congregation and you find that you love them, then you can open your mouth and begin to preach. 
And I've not found that in any of the basic manuals, but it does seem to be part of the consensus of the tradition that one is on the pulpit as somebody who loves the congregation rather than somebody who is just set in judgment over them. And on occasional moments, there have been occasional emotional highs when I have indeed been gifted with that sense of genuinely loving at least most of the people that uh, I know in the congregation. There are one or two hard cases. I hear their confessions and know their secrets. But generally, this is the challenge. This is the challenge to actually love and to be trusted to love. Those who are looking at me and looking up at me and want to know that I faithfully represent a millennial tradition and that I am transmitting this tradition in a faithful way to them and their children, they trust me. Uh, and I have to think about what are the criteria for that trust. In what sense do I have the right to be there? It's a very exposed position. One is not supposed to have even the comfort of a lectern in front of one or the comfort of notes. One is, as it were, naked and exposed, humbled in front of their critical gaze, and many of the texts must be memorised. It's a somewhat humbling experience. On what basis can they trust me? Well, one could mention a practical point which has become a significant bone of contention, unfortunately, in our communities, which is that they are trusting me to represent only God's religion as it has been interpreted historically by the consensus of the community and not to be grinding anybody's covert acts. That might seem to be an obvious thing, but in the great majority of Muslim jurisdictions today, preaching is not free. The man who is on the pulpit is not free to say what he wishes. He is not free to denounce the regime, to talk about various nations' foreign policy, to talk about the exploitation of foreign workers, to talk about the treatment of the poor and the bad behavior of the rich. He is not free. In an increasing number of Muslim countries, the sermon comes down a fax machine or is downloaded from the Ministry of Religious Affairs, and woe betide he who strays by any jot or tittle from that official sermon. This is the case in Turkey, 80,000 mosques, and in every one, the imam has to read the state's sermon. This is the case now in Egypt. This is the case in some Gulf states. Saudi Arabia is toying with the idea. Malaysia has official guidance. Kuwait has official guidance on the subject of sermons. So here, we enjoy uh, more trust, I suspect, from congregations, because we are giving voice to what we take to be the authentic uh, sonorities of the tradition rather than simply parroting the views of some particular regime. But this has another knock-on effect. In my experience, uh, British Muslim leaders who have tra trained abroad can sometimes be seen as tainted by the agendas of the regimes which have created the seminaries in which they have studied. And this is a very serious reason for the loss of trust in many traditional uh, Muslim places. Those British Muslims who are studying in Cairo, at Al-Azhar University, allegedly the world's oldest, a university with more than 200,000 students and 4,000 seminaries, an enormous empire of religious instruction, but strictly integrated into the security apparatus of the Egyptian state. To what extent can congregations truly trust those who have been processed by such an institution? Increasingly, we find a crisis of trust in mosque leadership, even if those individuals have trained in places that are ancient millennial repositories of wisdom and sincerity because they have been appropriated by the regimes. This is one of the great crises of trust in the Muslim leadership across the Muslim world today. And if the imam is reading the state sermon and is not talking about the behavior of drunken tourists outside in the streets, or the existence of street children, or the local brothel, or whatever it might be that is a major local grievance, but is instead simply repeating the state's largely um, immaterial sermon, a recent sermon circulated by the Turkish government, for instance, was on National Tree Planting Week. Uh, the result is a disillusionment, a lack of trust in the established religious leadership, and people will tend to go online. And this is profoundly subversive. This is one of the reasons for the growth of Islamic radicalism, that the existing voices, the existing custodians of the trust of the community are no longer increasingly being trusted. And we are not quite sure how to deal with this. These institutions are slow moving, politically usually quite quiet and inert. 
the policy has been to represent the communities to rulers, but never really to get involved in serious political agitation. And now we find that the young people are losing their confidence in those institutions and turning instead to uh, hotheads on the internet. This has become the largest single crisis in the Muslim community, and it is essentially a loss of trust. However, the community itself still trusts its leaders to deliver where they are away from the uh, supervision and scrutiny of the regimes. In this country, I would say that there is a high degree of trust in the mosque uh, leaders and in their message. People do actually do what they're told, sometimes in sermons. This was brought home to me recently. When I rode a taxi in Cambridge and the driver refused to accept his fare and I asked him why, and he said, oh, I heard you preaching about how one should not work as a waiter in a restaurant where you were obliged to serve alcohol. It's permissible until you find a better job, which is more lawful according to traditional, to traditional Muslim values. So now I am driving a taxi and I feel so much better about it. And I lost quite a bit of sleep about that because I realized that because of my interpretation, I've made a significant difference to somebody's life. But generally, communities, congregations in the Muslim uh, minority here do listen very carefully to their leaders. They do have a lot of trust in them. And one hopes that in the, I think, turbulent times that are likely to lie ahead, that that trust uh, does not prove to be misplaced. Because trust is a basic principle of the divine human relation, as well as the human human relation. One of my favorite stories, in a sense, the founding story of the Islamic religion itself is in Islam's particular uh, addendum to the great biblical narrative about Abraham and his offsprings. Abraham sends uh, Hagar, his Egyptian bondmaid and kind of surrogate mother, off into the desert to face apparent certain death and destruction. What other outcome could be expected if you send a foreign mother with her child off into the wilderness? It's like a kind of second sacrifice. And she asks him, uh, from where is this instruction? Is it from you or is it from God? And he says, this is God's command. And she says, he won't let us be lost. And confidently, she takes the hand of her son and marches off into the unknown. And it's because of that trust that the city of Mecca now exists. She is buried with her son Ishmael beside the Kaaba, that is the great sanctuary to which Muslims turn in prayer five times a day. That is the center of the Muslim pilgrimage. And she lies there next to the Kaaba, surrounded in the high days of the pilgrimage by maybe five million human beings who are there really because of her and because of her trust a trust that was ultimately not even in a religious leader, but in Almighty God. And it is that assurance that is the basis of uh, our claim to be representing Islam to congregations. It is because we trust God that we hope that he will bestow upon us the religious leaders uh, that the religion deserves, not the religious leaders that we deserve. So that's just a very brief aperçu on the uh, experience of Muslim leadership in this country. We're at the beginning, I think, of a complex journey. Uh, the leadership is still imperfectly adapted, I would say, to the rapidly changing culture of the younger generation. But still, the mosques are overflowing. 77% of British Muslims, according to a recent survey, are actively involved in the religion. Uh, I'm not sure, though, whether it's because they trust us or because they have a much wider trust in Almighty God. Tim, that was uh, absolutely superb. I think uh, the silence with which you were greeted is uh, an indication of people really listening, listening to uh, a description of Islam that many of us would not be necessarily familiar with across the world. Um, and I, as always, uh, what I've picked out on these occasions before I open the questions is the parallels between what our three speakers have said. Um, we've had at least a couple of references to towers. They've, uh, they've turned up. Uh, and as soon as you start to talk about the persecution um, in relation to what Tim was saying, the tower that Justin described 
the Lollard's Tower uh, comes in. We have been familiar, Tim, and you know this, um, with state religion. And I think that would be somewhere close to uh, our experience in the 16th century. Uh, and um, I just think that, that your, your coda to what your two fellow speakers said was of extreme interest. Um, I particularly liked, uh, and I think all of us noted, the emphasis on love, unconditional love, which every one of the three speakers sent, on, on which they centered their claim to leadership. And in terms of hard cases, Nick, I always remember the phrase of St. Teresa that everybody that she meets is an image of the risen Christ, but sometimes in a very unfortunate disguise. And uh, I think we all have had to deal with the hard cases. Now, it's your turn. We've got half an hour or so before I need to bring this to the end. My name is Dr. Fred from South Africa. Um, and I'd just like to address a question to Archbishop. Um, we spoke about trust tonight, and people don't follow a religion to trust in a person, but to trust actually in a scripture. So what, what do you think the role is in um, religious leaders giving opinions rather than um, speaking about scripture? <coughs> Thank you very much. Justin. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's only half true. I'm not entirely sure I accept the premise of your question. Um, I think people follow religious faith for all kinds of mixed reasons. Um, and part of the role of religious leadership is to <coughs> unpack and to apply part of the uh, scripture to the situation in which we find ourselves. It's, it's um, uh, in a sense, a, uh, in, in one of the things we do whenever we take a new post in the Church of England is, is you have to make the declaration of assent, which involves the words uh, to declare afresh the faith in every generation. And that means interpreting and applying the scriptures afresh um, for each generation. But I think I'd also want to start by saying that the heart of Christian faith is not the trust in the religious leader. That would be a very dangerous thing. Uh, it is the trust in Jesus Christ, in a person, who is then described to us, uh, unfolded to us, in the scriptures that we have. Thank you. Over there, please, if I can. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Jane Leek from Porticus. It's actually directed to all three or whoever wants to reflect. It stri just strikes me that loyalty has a relationship to trust, but the interplay of loyalty and trust and whether loyalty can sometimes take the place of trust. I welcome your reflections on that. Ephraim, can I ask you to have a go at that? That's quite a poser. <laughs> yes, I think that you're correct, that loyalty and trust are interlinked. And that is why it makes it all the more important for us in that position of trust, thanks to the loyalty that people have for us to be responsible. Uh, if I could reflect on your question and also on the previous one, to combine the two together, in our uh, Jewish communities across the world, the research that uh, we have engaged in in the last five years all suggests in all countries that when it comes to a question of attending synagogue and getting involved in a faith community, the prime consideration for people is not religious identity and it's not God. I wish it was, but it's not. It's more a question of where am I made to feel welcome? Uh, where am I made to feel important? Uh, what is the sense of warmth there? To what degree will I personally be engaged? Where are my friends going? And then the religious part accompanies all of that. We're dealing now with a younger generation where unlike their parents and grandparents, 
who did come to synagogue primarily out of the sense of loyalty because it's the right thing to do. Today, younger people ask me the question, what's in it for me? And they will only respond positively if we can prove to them that it is in their interests. And therefore, whereas previously, loyalty and trust went hand in hand, today, not so much with the younger element in our communities. And we need to prove to them that we are sincere, we are genuine, and they can feel comfortable in our midst and at home. Um, and younger people today are very wise to what we are really about. Uh, they suss us, suss us, suss us, suss us out uh, accurately. Um, and therefore, there's all the more reason today uh, at a time when attendance in places of worship is decreasing within many faith groups for us to show that we are real people, that we are genuine people, and that we are sincere. Thank you. Next question, please. Here at the front, please, and I'll come to you, sir, at the back. Just there. Thank you very much. My name is Sonia. I have a question for Tim. Uh, so you alluded to the fact that in Britain uh, there isn't a structured Muslim leadership. Um, but when instances happen and people are looking to a Muslim leader to give a view, have a voice, there is a risk that sometimes uh, Muslim personalities will speak up that don't represent the views of, say, 95% of the uh, British Muslims. So what can British Muslims do to create a structured leadership that has, uh, has at their head a sensible person that understands what British Muslims are about? It's an important question, of course, but probably uh, the question of how you unite so extraordinarily disparate a set of communities, probably speaking of the Muslim community here, but many very autonomous islands of, of Muslim identity, is probably insoluble. Uh, there are too many internal differences. Uh, one could perhaps, in a less turbulent community, hope for a settlement akin to that which generated the office of the chief rabbi, for instance, who presides really over a community that does have significant mm -hmm. internal, <laughs> internal differences. Well, recent occupants have been quite serene, despite what must be a, a, a difficult brief. Um, but at the moment, I don't think that communities are yet sufficiently mature to accept as a figurehead somebody who is doctrinally or in some cases unfortunately even ethnically not of their own particular background. Uh, in the longer term one would look forward to it as there is more intermarriage, more inter integration, more of a homogenization of the community. So one might see a situation akin to that of some of the Muslim communities in Eastern Europe in Russia or in Albania or in Bosnia, where well, the communities are much more homogeneous and they do have a kind of um, relatively formal hierarchy of religious authority with the head of the hierarchy in Bosnia, the chief mufti of Moscow, uh, presiding still over quite religiously fractious communities, but nonetheless representing an important and sane figurehead that can be asked to speak on the Russian equivalent of Newsnight might be, uh, that the individual as yet does not exist uh, amongst British Muslims. In the interim, I think the most that could be attempted would be to generate in different sections of the community, trained spokespeople who could represent the community in some credible way, who do have uh, adequate media training, who are alert to some sort of journalistic habits of ambushing religious leaders of unexpected or embarrassing questions. It's not an easy position to be in, particularly in rather an increasingly anti-religious British public culture. I think it's going to be more and more difficult for religious leaders to have their say in a fair and unbalanced way. It's difficult, particularly difficult for Muslim communities that are relatively recent here and haven't yet quite acquired the register of self-explication in, in, in the English discourse that, that would make sense to viewers of, of, of news like this. Too so much is different, too much background that isn't understood. So I would give it another couple of generations before we have a grand of the United Kingdom. I, I, I see just in your smiling, my sense would be that uh, while there is a hierarchy, you're still not surprised to find uh, people popping up and uh, making statements on behalf of the church that you don't necessarily agree with.
Oh, absolutely. It's, it's routine. Um, came back a few months ago on a particular subject, turned on the telly when we got in, um, and there was someone saying the policy of the Church of England on X is this. I thought, gosh, I didn't even know we'd asked the question. <laughs> um, so, yes, I, have a, I, I entirely agree, and I was also smiling at the thought of serene. Um, I can't spell it, I don't think, any longer. I used to be able to. Um, but I, it is, I think the culture is one in which anyone who proclaims of their own right to speak for a particular group is likely to be shot down fairly quickly. Um, there's not that unquestioning ex, uh, acceptance of authority of a particular spokesman. And with Anglicanism, it's very well understood that every bishop has their own opinion, every church leader has their own opinion, and uh, every senior member of um, uh, Laity, Ian, has their own opinion. <laughs> this is a, uh, an addendum, if you like, to the previous uh, question and your comment, and look at about. Um, I suppose it would, so, so perhaps the Chief Rabbi would like to comment, but any of the panel would be welcome to comment. It's said that people get the, the leaders they deserve. So, in that sense, what is the role for communities in a relationship of trust? A relationship of trust has two, two sides. What is, the, what is the role of communities of faith? What is the role of wider society uh, in helping to develop and support religious leaders who are trustworthy and in whom we can invest our trust? Ephraim, do you want to go at that one? Okay, uh, I'll start. Um, <laughs> well, the role of religious leaders is to promote the faith which they are representing, to engage with the adherents to the faith, to hope that those who are nominally part of their faith would become more engaged and more religious, um, to give inspiration and direction, uh, to lift people, to add spirituality to their lives, and ultimately to make better citizens of them within the country in which they're living. Because it's important in a faith context for us through our faith to be good people within society. Faith is a means through which we can contribute to our environment and in the first step we are loyal to what we are about and through that we have universalistic ideals. I wish that uh, you know, you were alert, alluding earlier on to, to the fact that we're in an ever-increasing anti-religious society. Um, and I wish that more respect would be given for the expression of religion in public spaces. So, for example, we're coming up soon to the festival of Christmas. And I, as a Jew, lament the fact that in the UK, Christmas isn't what it used to be. Why do I say that? It's because this country needs to have spirituality and religious input into our daily lives. Even if we're not part of what is being celebrated, we need to respect it and to appreciate all the positive features that it presents to our society. And people speak about tolerance. Yes, it's important for religious people to be tolerant towards those who are irreligious, but it's also important in our country for those who are irreligious to be tolerant towards those of us who are religious. Uh, Andrew Briggs, there's a question about trust, not so much in behavior as in truth. In other words, when in a position of leadership, uh, one's wanting to say what's the effect of, trust me, what I'm telling you is uh, true about <coughs> ultimate realities, what do you find to be people's court of appeal in that? What are the criteria by which they assess uh, what your reasons are for believing that to be the case? I think, Andrew, I would start with previous experience of the community from which you speak. I think some coherence in what you say. Meeting a perceived or felt need in the person to whom you're speaking. Uh, what uh, the chief rabbi was just saying, um, that sense of uh, there is something here that speaks to me and my needs. 
and a coherence in the rationale for trust that you put forward. Though I think that comes very much last. The biggest single hub is, that might do it, is people's biggest experience. The vicar who took my dad's funeral was wonderful, so I'm going to listen to him. Or the vicar who took my dad's funeral was a waste of space, so nothing you can say will enable me to listen to you. And I suppose I would uh, <coughs> expect me to. At the heart of it all is the work of God's Spirit in answer to prayer. Thank you. Would, would the panel agree that we do have a particular problem in Britain, which seems to be a particular problem in Britain, which is our media? In my view, those who have dealings with imams, rabbis, vicars, even bishops, generally find them nice, trustworthy people in respect for faith. But um, those who don't have the dealings, uh, who have no direct local relationship, only have experience of religious leadership through the media. And that experience is generally negative because we live in a religious society. And the media like reporting bad news stories. To go back to what the Archbishop said, uh, the sad event of sexual abuse was widely reported. The, the regret, not widely reported, and I fear that does distort the experience and attitude to religious leadership. I think the media are more careful now, partly because they can see the consequences of mass Islamophobia. EDL marches and other, uh, other alarming phenomena that have become salient of uh, uh, late. But I do remember at the time of the Salman Rushdie crisis, I actually phoned some Muslim leaders in the Middle East to find out if they agreed with Khomeini's fatwa, and they said, no, we've given this fatwa instead. And I then uh, called some journalists, uh, London broadsheet, and I couldn't interest any of them in the story. It was just confusing. It's that their readers wouldn't know who the Grand Mufti of Egypt was. They never heard of the Zaytun University in Tunis, and it was all too obscure and exotic. Um, that is still the case to some extent. And it is still, I think, the case that if, say, an atrocity happens in Northern Ireland, <coughs> thankfully that sticks, that's quiet now. And it did happen frequently. The media would then immediately hand to the face of the local bishop or other religious leader who had condemned the atrocity. But uh, the media doesn't do the same generally when there is some uh, outrage identified with Muslims. Partly because they don't know who to go to, but partly also because they're just not in the habit of doing that. And I've argued with them, but they say that it would, it would be very confusing and they might lose viewership. That's exactly what we're talking about. People just don't know what a mufti is, who are the heads of the Dalai Lamas. You can read a major broadsheet from cover to cover every day for a year and still not see the, the name of any major British Muslim leader. It's simply not known. And so that's partly the fault of the media, also, I think, part of the fault of the Muslim community for not doing the proper relations properly. I think there's a lot of catching up to do there as well. I think also, if I, if I go back to the period of Abu Hamza and the Finsbury Park Mosque, I think there was a, a reluctance to um, accept that what this man was saying could possibly have anything to do with the Muslim community because he was regarded by most mainstream people as uh, extremely um, odd. And he was also, of course, uh, the bearded cleric out of central casting, which wasn't very helpful. Uh, and I, do, I remember talking to uh, the leaders of the Muslim Council of Great Britain and saying, look, please get out there and, and make that point. So I th uh, it, both sides, I think, are here. And it, the more that the, the Muslim community can move towards answering that issue. Um, Justin, you wanted to come in. I'm not sure why I, I think the media have blind spots, but they are the same blind spots as we have in society generally. Um, people come to a particular subject, and at the moment, a particular subject of Islam, with prejudices and blindnesses, which make it very difficult for them to stand back and give an objective view. 
But I think I'd want to put the other side of the coin and say, A, you know, go back to my anthropology point, the media are surprisingly all human beings, uh, you know, the, the, the press and the, the journalists, uh, often dealing with very confused information coming in, and it's very difficult for them to work out who or what is wrong. And I think also they are, in my experience, uh, rightly and properly feeling that they have to try and probe because there is such a history, particularly from the religious the Church of England religious institutions in the further back of cover up. And and so I, I'm I you know, I I get cross with the media like everyone else, uh, as some of them here know. But my general, once I've cooled down, my general result is to give myself a kicking for not being clearer or enabling them to hear the story better. Do you want to say something, Ephraim? Just one uh, brief additional point. The media have a responsibility with regard to reporting events of a negative nature. They also have a responsibility to highlight good news stories. <laughs> and, uh, Thank God there are so many amazing good news stories with regard to all our faiths and religion in general. And sometimes I, I get some pleasant surprises. So for example, uh, we're, we're gathering here this evening after the, the weekend, which was a historic one for the Jewish community of this country. We called it Shabbat UK, with more than 100,000 people <coughs> celebrating keeping the Jewish Sabbath in a way that it's never been done before right across the country. And the national media have grasped the story and have broadcasted it in all kinds of ways. I know I've been on radio, television, various newspapers. And this is a fine example of how we can celebrate some of the outstanding successes of religion. So this event this evening is centered around one of the challenges of religion. And likewise, we need to have similar events and the media needs to cover the way in which we celebrate our incredible successes. First, I wanted to thank all three of you for speaking this evening. Um, my question is specific to Chief Rabbi. Um, what, I guess, tips do you have for a leader to de in dealing with self-doubt and fear? <laughs> We've got many. <laughs> um, self-doubt, I think every single one of our great prophets doubted themselves doubted God. That's a bold thing to say. Challenged God. That's what we have Abraham challenging God over Sodom and Gomorrah and etc. Um, we are humans and uh, we need to use our human capacity with honesty to approach faith and the Almighty. Fear also very common. So God said to Abraham, do not fear Abraham, I will be your shield. And the Talmud spends many pages in discussing all the possible reasons why Abraham might have been full of fear at that moment. Uh, similarly, when Jacob was confronted by Esau, even though he had the divine promise that he would remain in life and he would continue to convey that baton to future generations, uh, he expressed fear. We are very human, and the Bible presents us in our raw state uh, and a very important part of our Jewish tradition is there's no airbrushing. Everybody is there. Moses, our greatest leader, he sent. Joseph, he, whoever the person was, because like us, they were people of flesh and blood and we need to emulate them in their successes and also how they confronted the challenges of where they went wrong. Good evening, my name is Judy Siddiqui. Um, I have, uh, I agree with the rabbi that it's very important for people to feel welcome in our institutions and places of worship. And as a Muslim who's been Muslim for 20 years this year, I've been doing a lot of reflecting. And as a woman, I've been uh, actually told that I can't come into some of my own places of worship simply because they don't have space for women to pray. Um, and I've reflected that over the 20 years I've not really seen much improvement. I'm wondering what will happen in the next 20 years. 
Um, but I've also realised uh, very uh, starkly that actually friends that I've made, female friends from all three faiths, are actually facing similar challenges, maybe manifesting themselves in different ways. So my question to my three brothers here would be, what advice would you give to me and my friends from all three faiths of what we should do on this issue um, going forward for the next 20 years? Just bearing in mind, I've seen the film Suffragette twice now, already, <laughs> and I'm uh, feeling extremely motivated. <laughs> Don't give up, but be patient. Push as much as you can, courteously, against crusty old male establishments that don't like to be told by women to change their comfort zone. You just have to, to be patient and persevere. You can see this if you're a regular visitor to the sanctuary in Mecca to see where the women are allowed to be. Sometimes they are actually quite close to the Kaaba, it's what we call the wedge, they have a kind of V shape and they get very close to the sanctuary, and sometimes they seem to be right up the back. And that is talked by the locals. Uh, the result of lobbying by the local women, women at Mecca who just keep kicking the authorities to the sanctuary to allow them the space. As soon as they stop kicking, unfortunately, they get moved back again. So um, there's probably similar uh, stories in other religions, but certainly Muslims often very male-centered places of worship. There are often citadels of um, male reaction, and that's for the women to remind them that women had no problems ever worshiping in the Prophet's mosque, and they are equally subject to the basic duties of the religion of the that is, as men are, and they also give them that right. I wanted to ask you, um, what's your opinion about the presence of religious leaders in political issues and their opinion? And do you think that is going to affect the trust of the congregation who might have a different political issues, uh, political opinion? Thank you. I mean, which will now be very brief. I think when we look as though we're taking a party political line, uh, we lose trust very quickly and quite rightly. When we seek, like every human institution, to be deeply involved in seeking, in the words of Jeremiah, the good of the place in which we are set by God, then uh, trust is improved. We cannot be apolitical. It was an apolitical attitude by the German church in the 1930s that led to that church being suborned by Hitler. We have to be political, deeply and profoundly political, but absolutely not party political. It's a very difficult balance, and we'll get it wrong regularly. Or I will get it wrong. Uh, and, and with that, which I think is a very profound statement, I'm going to bring the question and answer session to a close. And that's because I have learned over many years that the chairman of organisations and conferences that keep people from their refreshments it becomes rapidly rather unpopular, so I don't intend to do that. What I would like to do, though, is on behalf of the Wolf Institute, uh, uh, and on behalf, I hope, of you all, is to say that we've heard some very profound things this evening, some very, in, in ways, very similar, but as always in, in matters of religion, diverse as well. Uh, and for those of you who've been following this series all the way through, what I can say to all three of you is that you would have heard echoes of what you said, not everything that you said, but in the difficulty of leading large organisations or in, in, in cases, some cases like at Tim's where he leads one kind of organisation but the, the religion itself has a different sort of organisation. Some of those challenges spread right across. And if I can say... Um, to our three panellists on, on your behalf a very great thank you for what you've said and we look forward to uh, perhaps hearing more in individual conversations in a moment downstairs. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>